Have you ever wondered how the opponents work in Mike Tyson's punch out? Glass Joe, Bald Bull, Super Macho Man, Mike Tyson. These boxers aren't your traditional side scrolling enemies. They have patterns to their behavior and can block, dodge, and counterattack. Punch Out is not a boxing game, it's a rhythm game in disguise. Timing is key. These opponents are complex in design. 11 boxers in 14 fights for the main game. With 128k PRG space available in the cartridge, how would you code them? An opponent has an itinerary for a given round. Players are likely to notice this schedule after fighting the same opponent multiple times. Glass Joe doesn't do anything for the first 40 seconds of round 1, backs up and taunts you, and then finally begins throwing punches. That is, of course, until you discover a well-timed punch after the taunt will knock him out. How do you write an opponent scheduler with boxer-like animation, plus reactions to punches from the player, plus seemingly random punches thrown at the player? If conditionals become bloated, and then finally you start inventing things like, oh but wait, and I almost forgot. You don't really have the capacity for this sort of conditional insanity for all of these boxers. We need an engine, something boxer data alone can pass through and be interpreted into logic for the game. Perhaps one engine governs the animation, sounds, conditions, and more for the opponent. Another engine would be responsible for handling the punch scheduler. Yet another would handle the animation, conditions, etc. for Little Mac. And the engines would need to shift gears when their boxer throws a punch or gets hit. Not going to lie, the code is a bit complex. We'll oversimplify it a bit and focus on the details of the opponent state engine component. How do we begin to turn the boxer from a stack of sprites into a threat? We'll also take a look at some surprises hidden in the crowd, and even face Mike Tyson himself. Okay, let's tackle that opponent engine and begin with some values in RAM. First up, we have the opponent's current state and state status. These values are macro states such as idling, like Joe is doing here, throwing a left punch, right punch, getting hit in this direction or that direction. A single value is assigned to indicate a certain state while the details of that state play out. A pointer to the table in the ROM is stored in RAM and used for locating the opponent's code itinerary table. On a more micro level of sorts, we see the state timer. It is used often as there are numerous frames used for animation in a given state. So while the state is set to idling, the frame set used for Joe's animation, his coordinates and more are being changed as the timer is counting down until the next operation. This frame, now that frame, now play this sound, now check this value, now write that value. The table is traversed by the engine and branches in the code based on commands and supporting data. Why use a pointer stored in RAM for the table address? Why not just say, use Glass Joe's table at this address in the code? Well, multiple tables are used by the opponent engine during a fight. We need to be able to go full steam ahead on one set of boxer train tracks, so to speak, and then suddenly switch tracks for a moment and then switch back. Changing where we look up the next actions on the itinerary in the ROM is key. So, we maintain that destination in RAM so it's flexible. And where are we in a table at any given point in time? We need to keep track of that, so an index value is stored in yet another location. Finally, we have a repeat counter. We may need to pull an item from our itinerary table that needs to be repeated a few times, possibly looping the table back upon itself using an earlier index value. That counter gets stored here. There are more items, but this should do for now. This is a set of core values in RAM for the opponent state machine. You can see all the counting and switching that takes place even when Glass Joe is quote, doing nothing. The primary method of executing opponent logic is to iterate through the state table, read the next command, and handle it, courtesy of some really fancy jump logic. We may touch upon that logic in detail in a follow-up video, but let's oversimplify for now. Punch-Out has a primary game loop, like any other game. There are a lot of subroutines executed here, and you can see that what is here is a bit of a work in progress. Our focus is the opponent handler base subroutine. After various checks here and there, the logic may decide that it is time to handle opponent state logic. This is the logic responsible for pulling our next opponent related command from the itinerary table. After extracting the value, it calls the jump handler subroutine to know where to go in code to process the byte value for the command we just pulled. What are the possible values from the table? Behold, the largest comment I've written in the history of this video series so far. 
far from complete, this lets you know how much of a launch pad the jump handler is for opponent logic, as well as how behavior is not based upon conditionals that constantly check the round timer, but rather on a stream of data from a table. Let's take a look at some specific examples of what might roll through here. First up, a simple animation command for Glass Joe, a value of 16 hex. Each byte loaded from a table is split into two nibbles by the handle opponent state logic. So in this case, the left nibble, a value of 1, goes into the accumulator. The right nibble, a value of 6, goes into the X register. After that split, we execute the jump handler. The accumulator value of 1 passed from the handle opponent state logic tells the jump handler where to jump for this operation. In this case, 1 steers us to some animation related logic. After the arrival, we update the state timer, change some animation related values, and alter the location of the opponent. A good set of things to do. The state timer value is set to that 6 we saved in the X register. The animation index update, along with the new X and Y coordinates, come from the state table immediately after our opponent command. No extra lookups from other tables were necessary. And that is the gist of how the table works for most of the commands. A command is provided so we know where to go in the code for our logic. Any number of bytes that follow it can be used as support values for the logic to be executed. With the operation complete, the index is updated so it points to the next command in the table, to skip us past all the support values we just used as we don't want those processed as commands in the future. The next command will be picked up and processed the next time through the loop. We'll take a look at some other examples, but for now, let's stick with this one. It's Game Genie time. These are the X and Y location values used as part of our animation operation example from the state table. Let's change each of them to something very different and see what happens. Wow, that's pre pretty distracting. Let's slow it down. So it appears our example is a single sprite set that is part of Joe's idling cadence that is streamed out of this data table during gameplay. We just dropped in some customization. Note that Don shares the same body type as Joe and also follows this sequence. The change is present for him as well. Boxers that share the same logic bank may also share a state, such as the idling animation logic in the case of Joe and Don. Some sequences are boxer specific. Let's talk about Great Tiger. That spinning around the ring maneuver that Great Tiger does uses a long sequence of 11 hex commands to relocate the sprite to a new place for a single frame. It alternates the side of the ring he occupies with each new frame. When played in sequence at 60 frames per second, it appears he is moving clockwise around the ring at a very fast speed. That entire sequence of animation is contained in these blocks. Remember the new X and Y locations for each opponent frame are the third and fourth columns. So, we could reverse the order of XY location updates for each batch of 8 and now he rotates counterclockwise. I may have missed a few sprites, it looks crude, but it does appear that he rotates counterclockwise. We changed quite a few values for this, so a Game Genie code won't cut it for this one. Sorry. Alternatively, we could alter the number of frames signaled by the 1x instruction. If 11 hex means for one frame, let's change all the 11 hex values to 1f for 15 frames. With the game running at full speed, Great Tiger is noticeably slower. Now, altering frames of animation, sprites, coordinates, and more by editing a lookup table is nothing new. We've done that before with Ninja Gaiden. However, as we know, this table not only holds values, it also holds commands, what to do next, and we've only examined a single command so far. And if we return to this partial decoding of table commands, it stands to reason that you could start to program your own boxer by shoving the desired data into tables in the ROM. Punch-Out's engine will interpret your commands and data and jump to the correct code to bring your boxer to life. This is how the game was written so multiple boxers could be programmed without an extraneous amount of code. A table holding commands and data serves as a code compression technique of sorts. And this is just the opponent's jump handler for basic behavior. As mentioned, Little Mac has a handler. Either boxer throwing a punch adds to the equation. In short, animation, sound, timers, conditions, value assignments, and more for the opponent roll through this logic handler, or interpreter, if you prefer. With a fair amount of investigation done for how the engine processes the various byte commands, 
Perhaps we can examine engine processing from a distance rather than one byte at a time in the debugger. The Lua scripting feature built into the emulator Messen allows you to write messages to a console log. So, if we were to hook into the code execution right here with our Lua script so we can examine the opponent command being processed, translate it into English using our comment block, and write it to the console log, now we have a fight log, or at least part of one for basic opponent behavior. Everything we know, or think we know, about the opponent state table command bytes is interpreted in this window. As mentioned, there are other jump handlers in the code. We'll leave out little Mac code for now, but I've included a partial punch handler for the opponent. The log puts a little box around the punch thrown text like so. Glass Joe has finally thrown a punch. Let's see what happens in the order it occurs. The opponent's defense is loaded at the start. When an opponent sets up for a punch, he might be more vulnerable to a punch from Little Mac in a specific place or places, either left or right, and high or low. Joe sets up with a defense of 8 in each quadrant, and he should block a punch thrown in this split second. When he pulls his glove back a few frames later, the defense shifts so he is vulnerable on his punch side high. So Little Mac can connect by throwing a high left punch before Joe takes a swing. Start opponent action kicks off the action, a punch in this case. Why call it action? What else could it be? Well, Glass Joe's little backup where he taunts you for a moment is also considered an action. The opponent outline timer assignment command here makes sense. Glass Joe has a color flash prior to throwing his punch and this assigns a time to his outline. A sound effect plays for the punch and we set the opponent's punch side and damage. Punch handler logic elsewhere deals with things like the damage assigned to Joe's punch, if Mac was defending, and more. We could obviously add details for this process to this log as desired. Several opponents have special actions they perform during a fight, such as the bull charge from Bald Bull and Piston Honda's Bonsai Rush. Not that long ago, it was discovered that the crowd gives you a tip as to when to react on the controller in order to handle the opponent's action. For Bald Bull, it's a camera flash from the crowd. For the second fight with Piston Honda, it's a head nod from the bearded spectator here. The crowd tips are part of the behavior data streamed to the opponent engine from the itinerary table. A value in RAM and address 46 hex is set to a non-zero value so the game knows to load override graphics for the crowd when it comes time to draw them in the frames that follow. Punch low at the same time the flash bulb goes off in the crowd when Bull is charging, and he goes down. Players can dodge the charge, and he will continue to try again. RNG is used to randomize when he charges forward, rather than use a set number of bobs beforehand. If you need to get your timing just right for a punch, continue to dodge and watch for the flash bulb in the crowd. Try to anticipate when the flash bulb will go off and time your button press for that moment during the next charge. To counter during the second fight with Piston Honda, punch at the same time you see the head nod in the crowd. You only get one chance to time it just right, so this nod is more of a trainer for future counterattacks against Honda. We can track a write to 46 hex and RAM to find instances where crowd changes occur in other fights. Super Macho Man has a moment of hesitation before he throws a spin punch. A write to RAM occurs to signal a change to this member of the crowd wearing sunglasses. This time you can wait for the head nod and dodge after seeing it. Finally, how can we cover Mike Tyson's punch out without talking about facing Tyson's punches in the game? Lightning quick uppercuts for the first minute and a half. Short delays between them, long delays between them, left punch, right punch, how does Tyson's attack work? This is it. This is an excerpt from a table of commands, timers, punches, and RNG. This is round one, phase one of the Mike Tyson fight. Let's decode it using a pre-recorded fight versus Tyson. Punches and wait time are the two primary components for a given phase. The value of the wait time, called the phase timer, has been placed inside an overlay over the game footage. This is a different timer than the state timer mentioned earlier. To the right of the game footage is our console window for our log. Scripting for this log is only monitoring the punch scheduler, so it has been hooked into command processing for our table. We'll walk this table from left to right and top to bottom. Some numbers are commands, some numbers are support data for those commands. Let's manipulate it a bit for the sake of illustration. 
We'll place a key for the commands in the top left corner so you know what they do, and we'll change the color of the command values in the table so they stand out. All values in the table are in hexadecimal, but some bytes in the table are used as timer values, so let's convert those values to decimal. That way we can let 10 be 10, 16 be 16, etc. Easier. We are set up for our walk. It looks like a lot, it isn't. I will talk you through it using the table. Note the log will run slightly behind the action, so I recommend watching the table and treating the log as a secondary reference. I will use a yellow box to show you where we are and I will move it around the table in real time with the fight when we let the footage roll. Should be wild. Let's go. First up is an 80 hex command to set the phase timer to 64. We wait on Tyson. A command with a leading zero indicates a punch. The number following the zero, a one in this case, is the timer value for after the punch. The next byte of 97 hex is the punch ID. It's a left side uppercut. Tyson punches. Command 81 hex is timer RNG. We set the phase timer to either 16 or 24 here. What is it gonna be? 16, our first RNG of the fight. Let's let it roll. Next up is a right side punch, 9D, with a post punch timer of one. Timer RNG is next. What do we roll, 32 or eight? We rolled an eight. Pretty simple so far, right? Punch, wait, punch, wait. Now before we let the footage roll for our timer value of eight, let's look at the next stretch of commands. 15 hex signals branch RNG. What is that? At this moment in the fight, RNG determines whether or not we jump somewhere else in this table. If we do, the next byte, an index of three, tells us to jump back up to here. Or RNG causes us to proceed with the next command, which is a left side punch with an after punch timer of eight, and then another left side punch with a timer of one. For this particular stretch in our current example, the branch RNG will not branch. Therefore, timer eight, left side punch, timer eight, left side punch, timer one. Here we go. Next timer RNG rolls 32. So we finally have a bit of a wait before the next sequence. That next sequence of commands happens very fast, and here is why. After the 32 timer wait, we have a right side punch timer two, right side punch timer one, and then back to back timer RNG. After this, the punch logic loops back up here. This back to back timer RNG during this stretch has a large range of duration possibilities. Check this out. You could potentially roll a timer value of 128 followed by a second roll of 32. This would be a long and potentially anxiety filled wait for Tyson to throw his next punch. Another possibility is that you roll a timer one and then roll a timer one and therefore immediately see a left side punch. This is exactly what happens in this example. Wait for 32 and then a quick right, right, left. Ready? Here we go. And now we are back up to an earlier spot in the table and have rolled a 24 for our next timer value. The sequence can continue to loop this table as many times as necessary before the logic moves us to the next phase. Before we saw this table, Tyson's punches probably seemed to be thrown at random times. This should still hold true for the player. It should feel random. Behind the scenes, however, we're on a schedule, and the RNG simply determines how long we wait between punches. And even then, that duration isn't random. It's one of two possible values. So long as branch RNG here doesn't return us to the top, the punch order will always be left, right, left, left, right, right, repeat. Good luck. Or we could use two game genie codes to reprogram phase one of the Tyson fight. As mentioned, the 1F command is a forced branch. The byte that follows is the index value for where to go. There are many ways we could proceed here. How about we let Tyson throw a left side punch and then loop back up to a timer of 64? This entire sequence will just repeat over and over. Timer 64, left side punch with timer one, repeat. That's a pretty good cheat, in my opinion. Is it still too difficult? Well, we could move our force loop over to an area even earlier in this sequence. That would mean that for the first minute and a half, you can just stare at each other as we continue to loop to the command to set the phase timer to 64. 
Well, that was an appetizer for how things work behind the scenes for opponents in Mike Tyson's Punch Out. If you want more videos like this one, please like the video and subscribe. I also have a Patreon available if you are interested, and thanks for watching.